My name is Jennifer Bonert from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And today I'm going to be talking about a project we've been working on for the past four years called Fire Foresight. Fire Foresight is a project where we're developing a new wildland fire model. We're working on visualizing the output and disseminating that output to our incident commanders and our firefighters in the field. So first of all, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, we are in Boulder, Colorado. Fifty years ago, our first director, Walter Orr Roberts, said, it's wonderful to have the opportunity given to us by society to do basic research. But in return, it's very important a moral responsibility to apply that research to benefiting humanity. This has been the mission behind NCAR um, for the past 50 years. Yes, we do do research, basic research, applied research, but all of that research needs to be usable by society. It needs to be understandable by our stakeholders. We do research on a lot of different topics, from climate change to extreme weather events. We take a look at a lot of different natural hazards, drought, extreme flooding, hurricane. And today I'm going to talk about the research we've been doing with wildfires. Wildfire is a major natural hazard. With our warmer temperatures, our increases in drought has increased our wildfire season. In fact, in many areas, there is no more wildfire season. Wildfire season is year-round. Land use, firefighting tactics can help to reduce our risk to wildfire. However, research shows that due to our cli changing climate, wildfire risk is going to be continuing to increase. So we've mentioned that we are going to be having more wildfires, especially in the U.S. West. But we also are expecting to see larger wildfires. And by large wildfires, I'm referring to wildfires which are over 1,000 acres in size. This chart here by Climate Central shows us over the past 50 years how not only has our temperature, our summer temperature, been increasing, but also the number of large wildfires has also been increasing. If we take a look at 2017, we can see that in the U.S. West, we had over 150 large wildfires burning. We see in our papers um, regularly, here's from last week on CNN, where they said uh, California's new norm, how the climate crisis is fueling wildfires and changing the life in the Golden State. A local news is talking about all the different fires that were burning last week, the Gettys Fire, Kincaid Fire, Tick Fire, Boris Fire, Oak Fire, and that the National Weather Service issued its first ever extreme red flag warning. And then they're also saying in the papers, California's fires show how unprepared we are for climate change, and that climate disasters require a new type of, of preparedness. So with all that in the making, NCAR teamed up with the state of Colorado and the Center for Excellence for Advanced Technology Aerial Firefighting to develop this Fire Foresight Project, or Colorado Wildland Fire Prediction and Deport, um, Decision Support System. NCAR is developing a new wildland fire behavior model. This model is called COFFEE. It's the Coupled Atmosphere Wildland Fire Environment. From the outputs of our COFFEE model, we are also publishing that information through web services in real time to our incident commanders and our firefighters in the field. It takes a lot of people to do a project like this, so I just want to acknowledge my colleagues at NCAR. We have um, a project lead, Jason Knievel. We have a slew of modelers working on this project, our engineering team. And I'm going to be focusing on the GIS aspect of this project, since that's where I've been involved in this, um, in Fire Foresight, is the GIS aspect, getting the data ingested in GIS, disseminating that information for our stakeholders. We, of course, are working with our partners at the state of Colorado. We're working with firefighters. We have quarterly stakeholder meetings so that all the information that we're working on this project, we get feedback from our firefighters in terms of how are we disseminating this, can you understand this, what more do you need? So what makes our, our, this particular coffee model unique? There's a lot of fire behavior models out there. As I'd mentioned earlier, we're seeing that there's more larger wildfires. And the larger the wildfire, those wildfires can create their own weather. So what the coffee model does is it not only takes external atmospheric conditions and weather to generate that fire behavior, 
but it also takes into consideration the weather that the fire creates. There's a feedback mechanism between the external atmosphere conditions, the internal fire uh, weather, in order to generate um, fire prediction for extent, flame length, and another other, a number of other variables. What's also unique about this project is that we're using GIS. So we're taking the output from our fire prediction model, we're bringing it into GIS. Here we can now only say where this fire is going, but we can start talking about who is going to be affected by this fire, what type of infrastructure is affected, how are evacuation routes affected by this fire. So it's a nice combination between our modeling team and our GIS team to really make our data more usable and to communicate the um, outcome and the impacts of um, the wildfire. So here's our GIS system design. I'm sticking with GIS because that's the area I know best. But we first have our coffee model that gets run. The output from coffee is being plugged into a Python data converter. All of that output is being stored in an enterprise geodatabase. And then all of that information is being disseminated through ArcGIS server. So the first part of this design is the coffee model. Our wildland fire model is a nested model. By this, what I mean is there are multiple domains. We first are using the high-resolution rapid refresh weather um, data from the National Weather Service. This is a three-kilometer um, data set. We're clipping this to Colorado, since that's our area of, um, of interest for this particular project. Then when a fire um, incident commander wants to initiate a fire, we have a web application where they'll either draw a polygon or put a point to say where that fire is initiated. That will spawn the coffee model. The coffee model takes the current and the forecasted her weather information, and it creates an outer one-kilometer domain. In that one-kilometer domain is where we run the fire weather information. Within that one-kilometer domain, we also have a sub-100-meter domain where we do the fire behavior. As I had mentioned before, there is feedback between our different domains. So our fire behavior is getting influenced through our fire weather domain. Our fire weather domain is getting influenced from the larger HER domain. We can run either three-hour predictions or 18-hour predictions for our particular wildfire behavior model. We do produce a number of different um, output from these models. We take a look at fire behavior. So here we're looking at things such as fire extent, rate of spread, heat release, and smoke concentration. The smoke concentration has been one of our latest products that we got released, and um, our firefighters, as well as our local EPA, are very interested in these particular um, output because air quality is significantly affected when we do have larger wildfires. We also have aviation products. Fires are not only fought on the ground, but they're also fought from the air, so we want to make sure that our pilots are, are safe. So we do produce turbulence intensities, up and down drafts, as well as wind shear. And then we do have our fire weather products. Probably the most important product that we distribute from that is our wind information, our wind speeds and direction, as well as gustiness. But we also have air temperature and relative humidity. So we distribute all of these different types of variables to our stakeholder. Our second piece in this design is a um, Python data converter. The output of our data is NetCDF. NetCDF is a very common weather and uh, climate data format. Uh, NetCDF is an array-based, multidimensional data. We heard a lot about multidimensional data this morning. And NetCDF has been interoperable with Esri tools for the past decade, which is amazing. If many of you have worked with NetCDF, you know that NetCDF can come in many different flavors. There are conventions that we are really trying to push our modeling world to conform to, the CF convention, our climate and forecast convention. However, if you work with modelers, or if you are a modeler, you know it's not always so easy to ask them to change their model or to add certain metadata to the model. The coffee model does not conform to our climate and forecast conventions, so it's not so easily ingested into Esri tools. There's a lot of reasons for this. One of the biggest reasons is our multi-domains and our nested domains. So in our output from a NetCDF, we have multiple domains in that one file. So what we've decided to do is develop a Python converter. And this Python converter takes our output from NetCDF and converts it into GIS-friendly data, our geotiffs and shapefiles. 
Once we have our data, our geotiffs and shapefiles, we're then able to store them in an enterprise geodatabase. So we're using Postgres SQL as our database platform. We have an enterprise geodatabase sitting on that. We load all of our geotiffs, all of our raster data are loaded into raster mosaics. All of our vector data, our shapefiles, are being loaded into feature classes. We also have worked over the past four years to figure out a good design for this data. Originally, we created a new raster mosaic and a new feature class for every file, for every um, variable. It started to get a bit out of control, as you can imagine. So then, with help from Esri, um, our new model is that we have one raster mosaic, or one feature class, for each variable. And we load all the fires into that one raster mosaic or one feature class. This makes it much more easy to work with our data, understand our data, and disseminate our data. So here's just an example of a raster mosaic table that we have. This is a flame length. Here, the key variables or the key attributes are fire ID, which will identify each of our fires, and time enabled, which is our temporal field. So we can make a selection. We can say, give me all the rows for fire ID X, and then we have a number of different times there, and we can start to animate and time enable this data so we can animate um, through time. And the final piece of our project is our publishing that data. And we are publishing our data with ArcGIS server through dynamic map services and image services. So once we have this data distributed through our ArcGIS server as image services or map services, it opens up a world of how we can visualize the data. Our stakeholders can bring this data into ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap. They can view it in ArcGIS Online. Or they can view it in a custom uh, web application that's been developed. They can overlay the wind information along with the fire extent information to see why is the fire moving in this direction? How are the winds changing over time? So by using these uh, types of map and image services, it's really opened up a whole window of how we can disseminate this information. And finally, we've moved this entire architecture up to the cloud. We're using Amazon Web Services um, for our Fire Foresight project. We have an instance uh, where we are running our coffee model in the cloud. And you can imagine running modeling in the cloud can be quite intensive. So we're utilizing AWS's on-demand services. So that instance is up and running all the time. When the fire gets initiated, it calls the service, it brings up that instance, it runs the model, it does the data conversion. When the model's done running, it shuts back down. So it really has become very cost-effective um, to run this in the cloud with on-demand services. We're storing all of our output in an S3 bucket. And then we have an Esri ArcGIS instance where we are storing that data in uh, our Postgres Enterprise Geo database. And we're also publishing it through ArcGIS um, through our Esri instance. Wildfires is a big topic, and rightly so, in this day and age. Esri is also doing a lot of work in trying to disseminate information on what is burning, where is it burning, um, and how can we stay safe. Here's a URL from an active fire app that I found on the Esri website, which I just love their new way of symbolizing some fires. It really just brings to the forefront. You can see right away where are the larger fires, where are the smaller fires, what is more intense, what is more impactful. So not only are we working on modeling fire behavior better, disseminating that information to our stakeholders, to our firefighters, but then being able to look at what Esri is doing with their new symbology and putting that all together could really develop some nice new applications. So we've said that wildfires are increasing. The size of wildfires are increasing. Larger wildfires are creating their own fire weather. It's more important than ever that if we are going to be doing some fire behavior, we need to incorporate the weather that that fire generates. The Coffee Project right now is working in Colorado. It's running in the cloud in a very cost and performance effective manner. This project could be utilized and could be brought to other areas, different regions, 
in order to really empower our incident commanders and our firefighters to better understand the phenomena and better protect themselves, life, and, in, um, and infrastructure. And with that, thank you. Thank you.